The first reading for today is from Acts chapter 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And we had said these things. As they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter 1. For this reason, because I have heard from, of your faith in the Lord Jesus, whom you love toward all the saints, I do not, give, I do not cease to give thanks to, for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you hearts, spirit of wisdom and of revelation and of the knowledge of him having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which you are as he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places? Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also to the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him gave him as his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Be Please rise for the Alleluia in verse. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 40, 24th chapter. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand, to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem you are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending you by the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them, and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him, and re returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple blessing God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Earlier this year, when we celebrated Palm Sunday here at Grace, we called it something a little different. We called it Homecoming Sunday. We welcomed back our members and friends who had been scattered by the pandemic and everything that's happened over the last couple of years. It was a wonderful and joyful day, to be sure. And we also reflected upon Jesus' homecoming to Jerusalem. The presence of God, the new temple, returning to its hometown. But in truth, that wasn't the only homecoming for Jesus. It wasn't his full homecoming. We're observing that homecoming today as we celebrate his ascension into heaven. Have you had the experience of welcoming someone home you haven't seen in a long time? Maybe they got a new haircut. Maybe they hadn't gotten their haircut in a while. We had a lot of those in May, June 2020, something like that. Maybe they lost weight, maybe they gained weight, whatever it was. When you haven't seen someone in a while and they come home, the changes can be dramatic. Of course, everybody changes, right? But the people we see all the time, with those changes, they're gradual. It doesn't come all at once. We don't notice it. But when we haven't seen someone in a long time and they come home, we get to see all that change at once. Grandparents will often have this experience when their grandchildren come to visit that they haven't seen in a long time. Oh, they grow up so fast, they'll say. And if that grandchild has dyed their hair a weird color or picked up a piercing or two since the last time they saw them, the response might be something more like, huh, that's different, right? That's the Minnesota nice way to say it. I picked up something when I was out there. But this morning, we're not here to talk about any ordinary homecoming. We're here to talk about the homecoming of Jesus. And he actually talked about it quite a bit. In our text last week from John 16, Jesus ate his final Passover meal with the disciples. And he said to them, I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. And on Ascension Day, that's precisely what happened. But when Jesus headed home, when he ascended into heaven, he returned to his Father different than he left. Have you ever thought about that? I've often spoken of the fact that Jesus is present throughout the entire Old Testament. There is no Old Testament God and New Testament God and although when I say it like that, it might sound ridiculous, and I hope it does, but even the most catechized person can sometimes fall into the trap of believing that, at least on some level. That in the Old Testament, God was one way, and in the New Testament, God is something else. And of course, the incarnation is a big difference. But our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons and one God. And that means that all throughout the Old Testament, Jesus is there. He is just as present there as the Father and the Holy Spirit are. The term we use to describe Jesus prior to that moment when he took on flesh and was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary the term we use is the pre-incarnate Christ. Jesus before the incarnation. Jesus before he took on flesh. He's different, but he's there. In other words, he came down from heaven and left his father as spirit, but returned as man in the flesh. And that's what the ascension of Jesus is about. Jesus promised he would return to his Father, and that's exactly what he did. But it was only after he died for our sins, rose from the dead, and appeared to hundreds of people, eating, drinking, and speaking with them. It was only after all of that that he ascended into heaven. He didn't die again so that his soul could go to heaven. No, he was taken up just as he stood there before the disciples. 
He was there on earth, the risen Christ, fully God and fully man, glorified. But when he ascended into the heavens, it wasn't only his spirit. He also ascended according to his flesh. It's important for us to know that the Jesus who returned to his father was different than the Jesus who left. He left heaven as God and returned as the God-man. This, of course, was the Father's plan all along. Jesus took on human flesh for us and for our salvation. We people of flesh and blood were cast out of the garden. In our sin, we had to be separated from God. You can't have flesh in the presence of our perfect creator. So how beautiful and fitting it is that in Christ Jesus, God and man are finally reunited. But in addition to returning to heaven as our flesh and blood, God, man, Savior, something else was different about Jesus, too. The scars. Listen again to these verses from Luke's gospel, starting at verse 50. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Now, when I read that part of the text... I immediately envisioned what this might have looked like. When Jesus was preparing to ascend to the, to the heavens and he put up his hands to bless them. There's a detail that Luke doesn't include here, but that I'd like to share with you. It's what those hands of Jesus looked like. When Jesus raised his hands to offer his blessing to the disciples, what would their eyes have immediately focused on? What would they have seen? Remember what happened with St. Thomas and his doubting. He demanded to see the scars on Jesus' side and in his what? Hands. Yes, remember, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and the scar in his side, I will not believe. Now, I don't know about you, but one thing I'm often ashamed of is how my eyes are drawn to scars. Immediately upon meeting someone, especially if I haven't met them before, there's almost an automatic reaction in which our eyes are drawn to scars. I imagine it's because the scar is something that doesn't seem to belong. It sticks out to us because it's out of place. And of course, we don't stare. We don't think less of someone for having a scar. Of course not. But it is a sign of some kind of trauma that has happened. So many of our brave men and women in uniform bear scars from service to their country. They've literally taken the scars of pain and violence so that we can sit safely and securely here at home. And not all scars are because of something bad, of course. The scars from a C-section, for example, come after a welcome and joyful event. But the body is still harmed and traumatized in the process, and so it comes with a scar. And then there are lots of scars that we don't see. The scars of depression and anxiety, the scars of abuse and betrayal, the scars of grief and loss. We can only imagine the scars that will be left after the tragic shooting in Uvalde, Texas, scars that will undoubtedly last a lifetime. Some scars give us stories to tell, stupid things we did when we were kids, injuries we sustained during the big game. But whatever our scars might be, they have one thing in common, and that's that something has gone wrong. And if someone we haven't seen in a long time returns home bearing new scars, our first question to them might be, how'd you get those? What happened? The scars we get are the signs and reminders of what has happened to us. Some of those memories are funny, some heroic, nearly all are painful. But when the disciples looked upon Jesus' nail-marked hands as he raised them in blessing, and as they watched those scarred hands ascend into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, the disciples saw themselves in those scars. All of us can see ourselves in those scars. Our sins were paid for by those scars. 
The prophet Isaiah said of Jesus, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Scars are the sign that our wound has healed. But no matter how faded they get, they never fully go away, do they? Because something has changed. And because of that, there's always going to be a mark. But what Jesus promised the disciples and what he promises all of us is a resurrection, a glorified body. And that glorified body is free of all those scars, a body that not only doesn't hurt, but doesn't bear the reminder of hurts before. Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. His resurrection came first. Ours will follow his, but his was different. When he rose, he still had those wounds. Why? His scars were assigned to the disciples and to us that the world is healing. While we're promised a future without scars, that future is only made possible because he bears the scars. He lifts up those scarred hands over all of us this morning and every Sunday morning that we come here for worship and all throughout the week and everywhere we go, he lifts up those scarred hands and he blesses us with them. And we have been truly blessed by those scars, blessed beyond our comprehension. And then when Jesus ascended into heaven, a few things happened. First, the disciples knew for sure that his mission was complete. Jesus took on the sins of the world. And when he was dying on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God the Father looked away from his Son. Jesus was wearing the world's sin, and God couldn't stand the sight of it. The only way that Jesus would be welcomed back into heaven is if all that sin were paid for and destroyed. When Jesus died on the cross, your sin died with him. And when he rose, your sin stayed dead in that tomb. There was no sin left on him, and no sin left on those who cling to him in faith. Our sin was gone, but his scars remained. Christ's ascension also means that Jesus returned to his throne on high. He's reigning over all of us. The sin that has kept us captive, the death that has kept us prisoner, Jesus has now taken death and sin and the devil captive instead. He's not the kind of king who lives in luxury and pleasure while his people starve in the streets. Instead, he's the leader who spent three decades learning firsthand what his people go through on a daily basis. We may think that Jesus is far away, that he doesn't care about our day-to-day problems. But dear friends, he lived them, and he died for them. And the third thing that the ascension means is that Jesus has sent his Holy Spirit to his church. The Holy Spirit works through the word preached, comes to us in baptism, and continues to serve us as our conscience, calling us to account for our sins, and also convincing our minds and hearts of the truth of Christ's gospel. Dear friends, the pattern has been set. Jesus' work on earth has been completed. Six months ago, we were in Advent, waiting for the Christ child to arrive. Today, that child's work on earth has been completed. And he returns to heaven the victor, the hero, bearing the scars of hard-fought battle. But just because Jesus has returned to heaven, that doesn't mean he's left us alone. Far from it. He's promised us the Holy Spirit. Every day he's working in our hearts by that Spirit. He's empowering us to serve our neighbor in love. He's giving us the strength we need to meet the day-to-day demands of this life. He's coming to us in the Lord's Supper, where we can touch, smell, and taste his presence among us. And now it's our turn to be his witnesses. The gospel that began in Jerusalem has now come all the way across the sea to this time and place. We're now free to speak with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and to believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. We're blessed to do what the apostles did in our text, to stay in God's temple continually and give thanks and praise him. Jesus' homecoming into heaven was met with joy by his Father, by the angels, the archangels, and all the heavenly hosts, 
But when he returned, he came bearing the scars of our sin, sin healed by his death and resurrection. The only scars in heaven are the ones found on our Lord Jesus. The blood he shed healed us, and his scars remind us that we are truly blessed and forgiven. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and